For today's story, we discuss the latest goings on in the United States Supreme Court in the case of Axion versus Federal Trade Commission. This is a unanimous decision of the U.S. Supreme Court and deals with whether or not you have to exhaust administrative remedies in the federal system in order to find out whether or not the federal agency has jurisdiction in the first place. So federal law, unlike state law, is fairly clear on this aspect. In order to sue the government, you first have to exhaust the administrative remedies that are available to you. You have to first go through whatever administrative process is available. So depending on the agency, depending on what you're trying to do, you have to go through that process. It's only when you get to a final agency decision that you then can sue the agency. The idea, of course, being that the agency, if they can give you what you want, great. You don't have to bother the courts. And then if you need to go to the courts, you can do that. Well, there was an issue as to whether or not you have to go through the process if part of your dispute is you don't have the jurisdiction to make me go through the process. Do you have to go through the process to find out whether or not they have the right to make you go through the process? You know, it's like a cat eating its own tail thing. And the Supreme Court said 9-0, no. If your argument is they can't make me do the process at all, then you don't have to do the process to find that out. So let's read this decision and what happened. Michelle Cochran and Axon Enterprise, respondents in separate enforcement actions initiated before the SEC and FTC, each filed suit in federal district court challenging the constitutionality of the agency proceedings that were opposing them. When, as in the enforcement actions against Cochrane and Axon, a commission elects to institute administrative procedures to address a statutory violation, it typically delegates that authority to an administrative law judge, which has authority to resolve motions, hold hearings, and then issue a decision. A administrative law judge, by the way, is a um, executive branch official. It's someone within the agency that helps to adjudicate issues that face the agency. It's part of a typical agency review, but they are uh, bureaucratic officials. They're not judges in the sense of Article 3. They are executive branch employees. As prescribed by statute, a party objecting to the commission proceedings makes its claims within the commission itself, and then, if needed, to the federal courts. But the parties here sidestep that review scheme bringing their claims in district court, seeking to enjoin the administrative procedures. So the statute says, look, um, go to the commission, and then whatever happens, go to federal court. But they're like, wait a second, this isn't constitutional. So you have no power. So I don't want to do that. So I want to go directly to court. The individuals asserted that the tenure protections of the ALJ rendered them insufficiently accountable to the president in violation of separation of powers. So one of the things is these ALJs, again, they're executive branch employees. There's been case law developing on this issue, which basically is like, look, they're inferior officers. They have to be appointed by the superior officer, which is to say the secretary of fill in the blank, as the case may be, and they have to be subject to being able to be fired. So these tenure protections are actually unconstitutional because it violates the appointments clause of the constitution. And there's definitely case law that's been developing around that area. So it's not a completely invalid argument. They also address the constitutionality of the prosecutorial and adjudicatory functions of the FTC. Each suit was premised on jurisdiction in district courts on standard federal question jurisdiction. So federal question jurisdiction just means this is a federal statute. So no special federal statute, no special federal regulation, just the generic statute that says Federal courts can hear federal cases. All right, so we're doing that. So they file the suit, and then both cases get dismissed by the district court. The district court in Cochran's case held the review scheme specified by the SEC implicitly divest district courts of jurisdiction over challenges to the proceedings, which, you know, kind of makes sense. We discussed this a little bit, right? You need to follow the administrative procedures first. The Congress says, go through the administrative procedures so, you know, you're, you're before the wrong body. Go talk to them, and then however it works out, you can go talk to me. But we don't have, the, the federal court's like, we don't have jurisdiction right now. This is an administrative issue right now. And that included challenges to the constitutional procedures. The district court in Axon's case found the FTC Act comparable with the review scheme 
as it relates to that statute. On appeal, the Ninth Circuit affirmed the dismissal, concluding that they're the same type that fell within the FTCs, but the Fifth Circuit disagreed as it relates to the SEC. So these were different cases in different circuits. The Ninth Circuit said, no, the district court was right. The Fifth Circuit said, no, the district court was wrong. And so both cases get kicked up to the United States Supreme Court at basically the same time. It's a split of authority on the issue. And so the U.S. Supreme Court has to resolve the dispute. The Supreme Court says the statutory review scheme set out by the SEC and FTC do not displace the district court's federal question jurisdiction over challenges of the unconstitutional structure. Although district courts may hear challenges to federal agency actions, by way of the general jurisdictional grant, Congress may substitute an alternative review scheme. In both the cases at hand, Congress tried to do so. It provided for a review scheme about agency action in a court of appeals following the agency's own review process. The creation of such a review scheme would normally divest district courts of their jurisdiction. But that scheme does not normally extend to every claim. This court has identified three considerations to determine whether particular claims concerning agency actions are of the type Congress intended to be reviewed within the structure. First, could precluding the district court jurisdiction foreclose all meaningful judicial review? So if it would prevent the jurisdictional, it would, if it would prevent the district court from acting practically as a result of this, like it would be too late or whatever, then that's a problem, right? If because courts can't remedy stuff that can't be remedied as a practical matter. So if it becomes irremediable, then you might be able to go to district court first because otherwise that would be really dumb. Next, whether the claim is wholly collateral. So if it somehow sidesteps the issue completely, then, you know, there's that. And then whether it's outside the agency's expertise, like it doesn't belong here. The court has twice held specific claims to fall within a statutory review scheme. In the underlying case law, a coal company subject to the Mine Act filed suit in district court instead of asserting its claims as the statutory scheme prescribed, first by the Maine Mine Safety Con Commission. The crux of the dispute concerned the company's refusal to provide employee designated union officials with access to the workplace. The company also objected on due process grounds to the agency's imposition of a fine. The court in that case held the district court lacked jurisdiction over the claims, emphasizing the commission's extensive expertise in these issues. I mean, that's what they do. They do the mining safety thing. So the district court in that case said, you know, hey, talk to the mine safety people about the mine safety issues. That's kind of what they do. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a lowly district court. I don't do the mine safety things. So talk to them. The court acknowledged the company's constitutional challenge was less tied to the issue of the agency's expertise, but concluded that it could be meaningfully addressed. So the mine, the mine people were like, our problem is constitutionality, and the district court saying they have expertise. No, not really. Uh, they do the mine safety. They don't have any particular expertise in constitutional law. In fact, that's kind of what courts do. The court applied the law, which involved a statutory scheme review scheme directs federal employees challenged with discharge to seek redress in the Merit System Protection Board and then in federal court. That particular individual filed suit in district court when the government fired him for failing to register for the draft. The court held the district court last jurisdiction, even though the issue was equal protection because of the draft exclusion of women. Although the MSPB might not hold the draft law unconstitutional, and that was sufficient to ensure meaningful review. Further, the challenge to discharge was near collateral to ordinary proceedings nor unrelated. In contrast to that case, the court in different cases determined that an accounting firm's challenge to the structure of the public, com com to the public company accounting oversight board under the SEC landed outside the review scheme. Because not all board action culminates in commission action, the court determined that the Exchange Act provides no meaningful avenue of review. So the issue there was that you couldn't go through the administrative process because as it relates to you, there is no administrative process. This is outside the scheme. So saying go through the scheme doesn't make sense 
because there is no scheme as it relates to that particular cause of action. And even if the SEC took up the matter, the firm's constitutional challenge would be collateral because it's outside their expertise. So which of these categories are we in? Are we in Merit System Protection Board where you're challenging being fired? And so we're, we're within the MSPB's experience. Are we, within, are we outside their experience? And so we should go to federal court first. So the court must decide which category we're in in this case. Like the accounting firm case, Cochran and Axon assert sweeping constitutional claims. They assume, they assert the SEC and FTC are wielding authority that's unconstitutional. And thus the court comes out in the case that says this issue should be resolved by the courts in the first instance. First, preclusion of district court jurisdiction could foreclose all meaningful review. Adequate judicial review does not normally demand district court involvement. The statutes at issue in this case provide for judicial review of adverse action, but in this particular case, they assert the here and now injury from being subject to the illegitimate proceedings would lead to an illegitimate decision maker. So part of the problem they assert is this is unconstitutional, and so being subject to the proceedings in and of themselves is an injury. So they have sort of this underlying thing that the FTC and FEC wants to adjudicate them on, right? So there is, there is an interest in that issue. But the proceeding itself is now an injury unto itself. Because their argument is like, wait a second, they're unconstitutional. And... Courts could review that, but the injury would have already happened. I would have been forced to go through the unconstitutional process. And so that can't be effectively reviewed. That injury would be impossible to remedy once the proceeding is over. Judicial review of the constitutional claims would thus come too late to be meaningful. To be sure, the expense and dis disruption of the proceedings do not alone justify immediate review, but the nature of the injury here is different. As with the right to not stand trial, that's effectively lost if review is deferred until after trial, for example, double jeopardy, which is one of the few instances, for example, you can appeal and say, look, um, you can't force me to stand trial again, double jeopardy. Forcing me to stand trial is and of itself an injury. So if you, if, there's, if you have a right not to stand trial, you can't be forced to go through trial because that would defeat the point. These people would lose their rights not to undergo these proceedings if they can't assert those rights until after the fact. The, the collateral nature of it also favors them. The challenges to the authority have nothing to do with enforcement-related matters, the commission's regular adjudication, or adjudication in asserting charges against them. The party's claims are thus collateral to whatever else is going on. Because the issue is, do you have power? And so. That isn't the issue of, did you do a bad, right? Do you have power to review me? Finally, these claims are outside expertise because, of course, these relate to constitutional questions, which is not really within the FEC or SEC's wheelhouse. That, of course, is primarily what courts are for. So the SEC and FEC have no particular authority. Thus, reversed and remanded by a unanimous U.S. Supreme Court. Thus, that brings us to the end of our discussion of the U.S. Supreme Court case of Axon versus Federal Trade Commission. There has been a lot of case law developing on this issue as it relates to these administrative law judges. Many agencies have them. They're not inherently improper. They're part of the review process. That's fine. But the problem has been the nature of how they get appointed and the review that has, they're subject to. So they have to be appointed by the superior officer, which in this case is the secretary of fill in the blank, as the case might be. And then they have to be subject to being fired because they have to be subject to review under the constitution's appointments clause. So a lot of these ALGs, ALJs were improperly appointed. This was an issue that confronted the patent office, for example, in this US Supreme Court has dealt with in this in the past. And so the SEC and FTC apparently had a very similar problem or might have a similar problem where these people are improperly appointed or improper review or the structure is improper. Now, that might be a relatively easy fix for the FTC and FEC, 
because the Supreme Court's already dealt with this in part, but, you know, you have to go fix it. And then once they go fix it, you know, then you can adjudicate the underlying thing. But these people can go to federal court in the first instance to find out whether or not the structure is improper. So if there's a problem, the federal court can fix it. Then the FEC and FTC can fix the problem and then go from there. But that is the decision by the Supreme Court. And that brings us to the end of the decision in that case.